Okay, in this video tutorial, we're going to work our way through the Edexcel November 2013 Calculator Higher Tier Examination Paper with the code 1MAO2H, and this is the front cover. Straight after the front cover, you've got the formula page. Now the formula page is a page that I advise you keep flicking back to throughout the exam as you never know there might be something on this sheet that can help you gain some marks throughout the exam paper. Now I know it says at the top here you must not write on this formula page but that's just really to remind you that anything you do write on here won't gain any marks. So I always advise putting anything down on this page that can just help you flick back to things that you're going into this examination paper probably trying to remember. Things like soccer tower. Some old horses can always hear their owner's approach for trigonometry and then we've got our cherry pies delicious, apple pies are too the circumference and area of circles, and anything else that you're going into that examination paper trying to remember, it's a great place to write down at the start. Okay, let's start with question number one. Now question number one is split up into two parts, part A and part B, and this question, this type of question, you can get support on with the top 40, clip number 33. The total marks is three marks split up into two for part A and one for part B. And it says use your calculator to work out this sum, and they're asking us to use the calculator. They want us to write down all the figures on the calculator display, and we've got to give our answer as a decimal. And that's giving us a bit of a hint that it's going to be a decimal number that's on our calculator display. Now the way I like to solve these is work out the top row first, write it down, work out the second row, write it down, and then use the divide line in between the two answers that we've just created. So the top row, if we bring the calculator in, is going to be the square root of 7056. So square root 7056, 84. So the top row, I'm going to put equals here, 84 on top of, let's clear off that calculator and work out this bottom row here, 0 0.35 times 12.8, 4.48. Now this line means divide, so I'm going to clear my calculator off and just do these two divided by each other. So clear the calculator off, 84 divided by 4.48, and that comes to 18.75. And that's my answer there for two marks, 18.75, a nice start to this exam paper. Now part B says write your answer to part A, this one here, correct to one significant figure. One significant figure is one number, one clear number. Now the problem is 18.75 doesn't really round to one number. So it's got to go to 20 where the two will class as the one significant figure and the zero won't. So the answer to this one is 20 for part B. And again, question number one, using your calculator type questions, you can find support on the top 40 clip number 33. Right, let's move down to question number two, which is on the same page. Now again, question number two split up into two parts, part A and part B. Now part A is ratio, and we've got support on the top 40 clip 25. And for part B is percentages of an amount, and you can find support on the top 40 clip 27 for part B. So let's start with part A first. Paval and Katie share some sweets in the ratio of 3 to 8. Katie gets 32 sweets. How many sweets does Paval get? And that's worth two marks for this part A. Now, the way I like to lay ratio out is by first having a letter, so P and K for the two names of the people. Underneath, put the two ratios, and they go in that order, so 3 to 8, in the order of the names that are given here. Katie gets 32 sweets, so I'm going to put 32 just underneath Katie here, 32. Ratio is always a divide, then followed by a times. So that means it's 32 divided by the 8, not both of them together, because it's just Katie that gets the 32 sweets. So my sum is 32 divided by 8. Now if this is a tricky sum, we can use our calculator, we're on a calculator exam paper, but 32 divided by 8 is nice and straightforward, and that's 4. The divide then goes on to the times, so 4 times the 3, so Paval gets 
12 of these sweets for two marks. Ratio, the letters for the words, the ratio goes underneath it, and then the amount goes underneath the correct person, which is Katie. The divide, followed by the times, three times that four. Ratio, top 40, clip 25 for part A. Moving down to part B, Katie also has a tin of chocolates. There are 80 chocolates in the tin, 45% of the chocolates have toffee in the middle. Work out the number of chocolates that have toffee in the middle for another two marks. So basically I'm working out 45% of 80. The magic percent is 10%, so that's what I'm going to work out first. So 10% of 80. So 80 divided by 10, again we can use the calculator for that, or because there's no decimal there visible, we can just take off that zero. So it'll be eight. So for the 5% part, it's easy, I can just half this number. So I've just worked out a couple of key percentages. Now I'm gonna need 45%, so I'm gonna need four of these. So I'm gonna need four eights. Four eights is 32. So I'll need four lots of the eight, which is 32 plus the 5%, so plus this 4 here, which comes to 36. So 45% of 80 is 36, and we've done that by getting the key percentages first. I've got a 10%, I've got a 5%, I've got four of those, one of those, and that's added up to 36 for two marks for part B of question two. Great, let's move on to question number three. Okay, question number three is worth two marks. Bill has some counters in a bag. Three of the counters are red. Seven of the counters are blue. The rest of the counters are yellow. Bill takes at random a counter from the bag. The probability that he takes a yellow counter, so the information that we haven't got, because it just says the rest of the counters are yellow, is two over seven. How many yellow counters are in the bag before Bill takes a counter? So what I'm just going to do here, I'm just going to make a note. So red, there's three. Blue, there's seven. And yellow, we don't know how many there are. But I do know the probability is two over seven of picking one of those. Now, the denominator of the probability, when it starts off, is going to be the amount that are there. Now this has been simplified down, because if you think about it, there's seven blues and three reds, so there's 10 there, which is already more than this seven. So what I wanna do, I'm gonna try and enlarge, increase up this probability until the number on the bottom makes sense for the numbers that are possibly present in this bag. So if I double this up and just get an equivalent fraction, and it's easy just to do the double first, and we can always do more if we need to, but four over 14. Now let's see if it works. Three plus the seven is a 10. Now this number has got to be the numerator for it to work. So if three plus seven plus four comes to 14, that means I've found my answer for how many yellows are in total in this bag. So seven plus three is 10, plus four is 14, which is the denominator. So there we go, I've just got an equivalent fraction to 2 sevenths, which is 4 fourteenths, I've just doubled both of them, and then I've seen if the story works to get to the total number in that bag. So there you go, there's three red from the information, seven blue, I've doubled the fraction, there's four yellow in total, add those three up, is there 14 there is, so there are four yellow counters in that bag for two marks. Great, let's move on to question number four. Okay, question number four is worth two marks and support on this type of topic can be found on the top 40, clip number 30. So the diagram shows a solid prism and that's just this 3D shape here. There's an arrow pointing in this direction. On the centimetre square grid, draw the side elevation. Now this word elevation just means a 2D picture from the side. 
So it doesn't want a 3D picture, it wants a 2D picture from the side of the solid prism from the direction shown by the arrow. So they're telling us that that there is the side of this shape as you're looking at that direction. The front elevation would be that surface there. And the plan is the bird's eye view, what it looks like from the top as you look down. So the side elevation is here. So you're gonna see these two surfaces directly on top of each other. And I'm gonna draw it 2D flat on this grid. I don't have to choose anywhere in particular. I can put it on this grid wherever I want. So I'm gonna see, first of all, this bottom part, five centimeters by two centimeters. So five across and two up. Now, ideally, in the exam, you're gonna use a nice sharp pencil with a ruler for this type of question. So five across and two up. So that's the bottom part as I look at this. Let's just join those up. And then directly on top here, you're gonna see, because you won't be able to tell that it's set back, you'll just see this on top of this. So three by five. So it's going the same width, but it's gonna go three squares high. So just add directly on top of what we've already drawn here, a further three centimeters or three squares because they're centimeter squares and join them up. And that's worth two marks for the side elevation of this solid prism, this 3D shape. And again, top 40, clip 30 for support on those type questions. Okay, let's move on to question number five. Okay, question number five is worth three marks and support on this type of question can be found on the top 40, clip number 34. Now this is an exchange rate question. We're dealing with money in different currencies. Ben goes on holiday to Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, Ben sees a camera costing 3,179 Hong Kong dollars and 55 cents. In London, an identical camera costs 285 pound. The exchange rate, the important bit of information here, is one pound equals 12.30 Hong Kong dollars. Ben buys the camera in Hong Kong, so he's paying this amount. How much cheaper is the camera in Hong Kong than it is in London? So we're comparing these two prices. This is what is paid. This is what it is back in London. How much is he saved? buying it over there in Hong Kong dollars. Now the only way to compare amounts is by having the same unit of currency. So we've got to change these Hong Kong dollars back into pounds to then compare the price against the London price. So I need to change 3179.55 back into pounds using this exchange rate here. So we're going to go from the Hong Kong dollars back to the pound, which is the one. When we go to the one, we divide, so when we're coming back to this one, we divide, so I'm gonna do 3179.55 divide by 12.30. 3179.55 divide by 12.30. It's a calculator paper, so let's put this straight in the calculator. Divide by 12.30, and that comes to 258.5. Now don't forget what we've actually just done. We've converted this amount here, Hong Kong dollars, back into pounds. So this is pounds. Now I know there's no zero on the end, but the calculators tend to do this. They chop off any unwanted zero. So this actually means 50 pence. 258 pound and 50 pence. So I'm gonna put the pound sign in. 258 pound and 50 pence. So this is what it cost out in Hong Kong. We've now got two comparable amounts because they're both in pounds. And the question was how much cheaper is it in Hong Kong than in London? So I'm gonna do 285 and take away this amount here, 258 pound 50 to see the difference between Hong Kong and London. And I'm gonna write that down as well. So 285, take away 258 pound 50. 285 minus 258.50 gives me 26.5 and again don't forget this is pounds so it's 26 pound and 50p 26 pound and 50p so we've converted this back to pounds coming back to the one we divided by the exchange rate 
that's the amount it is in pounds over in Hong Kong. We know what it is in London and we worked out the difference, £26.50. And I'm just going to put this on the dotted line as well, £26.50 difference. And again, support for these exchange rate type questions, top 40, clip number 34. Right, let's move on to question number six. Okay, question number six, and I've actually started the layout already there, is worth four marks. And support on these types of questions can be found on the top 40, clip number one. Now, I've got loads of information up here in my words. Now, as soon as I see loads of information, one way of sorting through it is a two-way table. And that's why I've started it already there for us. So we've got loads of information that I need to make sense of in order to work out how many adults study French. And I've got loads of parts of bits of information. I've got a total what it's out of. So I can put it all into a two-way table. And what I'm trying to work out is how many of the adults studied French. So I'm trying to eventually get to this answer here. So I'm gonna just go through the information slowly and put it into my two-way table. Men, women, so we've got our gender, male and female, total. And we've got our subjects across the top, French, Spanish, German, and again, total. Total, total makes it the two-way table. The first bit of information is up in the actual starting bit of information there. So there are 130 adults at a language college. So that's total, total, 130 goes down here. And then we've got all these bits of information to add to it. Each adult studies one of French or Spanish or German. So there's my subjects going across the top. 96 of the adults are women. So that's the total women, so 96. I like to tick these off as I've used them. Now, before I'm gonna read on, I can see here that I can work out the total number of men at this language college. Because if I know 96 are women and there's 130 in total, that leaves me 34 men. Again, this is a calculator paper, so you can use your calculator to do these sums. 96 plus 34 comes to 130. 12 of the women study French. So women, French, where that meets, 12. 73 of the adults study Spanish. So that's not male or female, that's total. For Spanish is 73. So Spanish, total, 73. 55 of the women study Spanish. So Spanish, women, 55. Now again, before even reading on from this one, I can see that if I've got 55 women and 73 total, that means I can work out what's left over for the men. So 50, 73, take away the 55, will leave me 18. And then finally, nine of the men study German. So men, German, nine. I can see straight away again that I can work across here to get to 34 and I've got 18 and 9. So 34, take away the 18 and take away the 9. So we're taking away 27 away from the 34 leaves me with 7. 7 plus 12 going down is 19. So I've got the cell, I've got the square that I'm after here, 19, but I am going to finish off my two-way table and make sure everything works before assuming that this is correct. So I've got 12, 55, and I need to get to 96. So that leaves 29 left over. 29 plus 9, adding down there, goes to 30. Eight. And yet again, this is on a calculator paper, so use your calculator to double check that going down adds up and going across also add up. So French total, which is the question that it's actually asking, how many of the adults study French, is 19. That I want to put down here on my dotted line for my final answer. And yet again, support on these two-way table type questions can be found on the top 40, clip number one. Right, let's move on to question number seven. Okay, question number seven is a starred question. So that means you're gonna get marks based on your quality of written communication, your QWC marks. The question's out of four, so at least one of those four is gonna be for you to finish off with a sentence answering this question. 
Plants are sold in three different sizes of tray. A small tray of 30 plants costs £6.50. A medium tray of 40 plants costs £8.95. A large tray of 50 plants costs £10.99. Kaz wants to buy the tray of plants that is the best value for money. Not the cheapest, the best value. Which size tray of plants should she buy? You must show all your work in. Now in order to show the best value, we've got to prove and show out of these three different sizes, which one actually works out the cheapest per plant. So 30 of them cost £6.50, but what does one of them cost to get there? Likewise with the 40 and the 50. So in order to work out the cost of one plant, I've got to divide £6.50 by 30. So let's get that down. So £6.50 divided by 30. Type that into our calculator. Now that gives me quite a long number there, but I'm going to write as much of that down as I can. That's important that we write down, if we can, write down all of the numbers we see on the calculator display. So 0.2166666. And actually, 66666 with that 7 at the end means 6 is carry on forever. That's 6 reoccurring. So I've just put some dots there to show that the 6 is carry on. Now with this medium tray, I'm going to do £8.95 divided by the 40. And that comes to 0 0.22375. And finally the 50 plants is going to be 10.99 divided by the 50. which comes to 0 0.2198. So what we've actually just done, we've divided the amounts in pounds by the amount of plants for each of them, and that's gonna tell us the price per plant. So this here is gonna be just underneath, we'd have to round it a bit, but it's just underneath 22p. So 0.216 would actually get that up to 22p, but just underneath it. Now this one is just over 22p per plant. That three, not quite big enough to round it anymore. So 0.22, just over 22p per plant. Now this one again, the same as the top one, the large tray is just underneath 22p, but a little bit closer than this one. So this one's very close to 22p. This one is 22p. This one's a bit further away from 22p. So the cheapest plant, the best value overall, is 21 pence, nearly 22 pence. Further away from 22p than the bottom option. So I'm going to put here the small tray is the best value because it works out cheaper per plant out of the three different options there and that's worth four marks not forgetting the starred element we must put a sentence to finish it off right let's move on to question number eight Okay, question eight is split up into two parts, part A and part B, worth two marks each, with a total of four marks, and support for this type of question can be found on the top 40, clip number 40. Here are the first four terms of an arithmetic sequence, and that just means a sequence that goes up by the same amount, and we can see that they're going up in sevens here on this one. Find in terms of n, an expression for the nth term of this arithmetic sequence. And an nth term is like a formula that, if you use it, can help you find any number of an arithmetic sequence. So the method of doing this is first finding that number 7 that these are going up in. So find the jump in the sequence. So these are going up by plus 7 each time. So that's 7n. Then you've got to work out what would be back here. So if there's another one, what would it be? And that would be 3 take away 7, which is minus 4. So 7n minus 4. So if I wanted to find any number of this sequence, n means the position number, so 7 times the position number take away 4. So we can check it out on this one. So the position of this one is 1. 
So seven times one is seven, take away four is three. The position of this 10 is two, so seven times two is 14, take away four is 10. So my answer for part A is seven N take away four. Now part B, is 150 a term would 150 be in this sequence? You must explain how you get your answer. Now the best way of doing this is by actually using your nth term formula up here. So 7n take away 4, would it come to 150? So if I solve this little equation here, and if I can get to a number for n, that means position number, so if it comes to a whole number, that means yes, 150 is in the sequence. So I want to see if n comes out as a whole number by solving this. So I need to get rid of this takeaway 4 by adding 4 and do the same over this side. So 7n equals 154. To get rid of this 7, I need to divide by 7 because it's times at the moment, so I'll divide by 7 this side. So if this now, 154 divided by 7, comes out as an a whole number, not a decimal number, that means yes, 150 will be in that sequence. So 154 divided by 7, 22. Yes, 150 is in this sequence. Just by solving 7n minus 4 equals to 150, to see if it would be a whole number. So yes, it will actually be position number 22. So that's position number one. If I carried on, position number 22 would be 150 for two marks for part B. And again, support for that type of question can be found on the top 40 clip number 40. Let's move on to question number nine. Okay, question number nine is worth four marks, and we've got this diagram drawn for us here. The diagram shows a pattern using four identical rhombuses. Now, a rhombus is like a pushed over square, pushed over square, so we've got four equal sides. We've got some angles drawn for us. Work out the size of angle marked A. This one here, you must show your work in. So, we've got to use the bits of information that we've got, plus some knowledge, some extra bits to try and get to this angle here. So the first thing I'm going to spot really is there's a circle there. If I carried this on all the way round, I've got a full circle. Now I've got four gaps of the circle, which are the 25s, and that adds up to 100. 25 plus 25 plus 25 plus 25 is 100 degrees. And then I've got these four gaps left over. So I can actually work out one of the angles of this rhombus here by doing 360 degrees, which is the full circle, take away this 100, and then divide it by four. So the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna write down here, is that four lots of the 25 degrees is 100 degrees. Then I'm gonna do the 360 take away this 100 which is 260 degrees. And then I need to divide it by four, because at the moment 260 degrees is gonna be these four corners of the rhombuses. So I need to do 260 degrees divide by four. 260 divided by four is exactly 65 degrees. Now I'm gonna draw that on the picture, I'm going to put that on the picture here, 65 degrees for each of these. Now, as I've put that on, it's made me spot that the opposite sides of these rhombuses, the angle there has also got to be 65 degrees, because as you push over this square to make a rhombus, you're going to have equal opposite angles, so I'm going to put 60 five degrees out. Now I'm not going to put it on all of, all of them because I only really want to deal in this rhombus because that's where A is. Now as soon as I put again these two numbers on that means that these two opposite ones have also got to be the same. Opposite angles in a rhombus are going to be equal. Now it's a four-sided shape, it's a pushed over square if you like, 
So it adds up to 360 degrees, all four of these. So if I do 360, take away these two 65s, and then half my answer, that's going to tell me what A is there. So I'm going to do 360 now, take away the two 65s, so 360 degrees, take away 65, take away another 65, leaves me with 230 degrees. So I've done the total angles in this rhombus, so 360, take away these two, leaves me with 230, and these two are what are left over. So if I half my 230, so 230 degrees, divide by two, half it, I don't need my calculator for that, that's 115 degrees. So this one and this one, these two opposite ones are 115 degrees each, which I'm gonna put on my dotted line there. It's got the degree symbol already, 100 and 15 degrees for A. And it all started off by spotting the full circle, 360, and then gradually, and I like to add my information onto the picture here, and it really does jump out at me what each angle is then, and we work our way down to 115 degrees for A, for four marks. Great, let's move on to question number 10. Okay, Sasha takes a music exam. The table shows the result that Sasha can get for different percentages in a music exam. And we've got this table here for the different percentage with the result it gets. So if she gets between 50 and 69%, she gets a pass result. Between 70 and 84% of merit, 85 to 100, she gets a distinction. Now she gets 62 out of 80 in a music exam. What result does Sasha get? You must show you're working. This one's worth three marks. So she gets 62 out of 80. Now the way I like to rewrite this out is the way that we would probably see on the front of that exam paper, written down by her teacher, 62 out of 80. So 62 out of 80. And that's probably the way it's been put down on the front of that exam paper. Now that line in maths means divide. So it's 62 divided by 80, and to convert this fraction into a percentage, we just have to multiply by 100. So to change 62 out of 80 into a percentage to then see what result she gets, all I've got to do is 62 divided by 80, out of 80 means a divide multiplied by 100. So 62, divide by 80, I'm going to press equals at that point, I always like to press equals at each point, and then leave it on the display, I'm just going to type in multiplied by 100, and that comes to 77.5, 77.5%, so she gains 77.5%, that's what 62 eight out of 80 is as a percentage, 77.5, which is in this section here, which is merit. So I'm going to put on the dotted line here, merit for the three marks. And it's as simple as just imagining what this would look like on the front of the exam paper. 62 out of 80, 62 out of 80 means a divide to convert a fraction into a percentage multiplied by 100. Then just look at which section it fell into, which was this one for merit for three marks. Right, scrolling down, which is on the same page, to question 11. Now this is split up into three parts, A, B and C, four marks in total, and you can find support on these type of questions with the top 40, clip number 36. So part A, simplify x to the power of seven multiplied by x to the power of three. These are laws of indices, it's the same base, so the x and the x are the same. We multiply, so we add the powers. So that law is that when you multiply, we've got indices with the same base, we add the powers. So seven plus the three, so for one mark, it's x to the power of 10, seven plus the three. Part B, simplify, and then we've got brackets, m to the power of four, all to the power of three. So m to the power of four in brackets, which is all then to the power of three. When you've got brackets involved like this, you multiply the two powers. So this law, we multiply the four and the three. So for one mark on this part, part B, it's m to the power of four times three, which is 12. 
Now part C is a bit trickier, but again, this line, just like what we dealt with up there in question 10, means divide. So we've got divide this time. Now when we've got powers, again on the same basis, so this F and F and the A and the A, we're going to take away the powers. But we've got a big number at the front of both, 36 and a 12. When you're dealing with the normal numbers, nothing to do with the bases and the powers, we do what we're supposed to do. So the 36 and the 12 are supposed to be divided. So 36 divided by 12 is 3. So we've got to put a big 3 at the front. 36 divided by 12 is 3. Then the first base is A. I'm going to put an A. Now on this A here, you can't see a power. But it doesn't mean there's nothing there, it's actually a 1 that you just don't need to put down. So that's a to the power of 1, and we've got an a to the power of 5 underneath with the divide. And again, we take the powers away when we're dealing with a divide. So it's 1 take away 5. Not 5 take away 1, whatever's on the top here, take away whatever's on the bottom there. So 1 take away 5 is minus 4. Then our next base is an f. And we've got an 8 on the top and a 2 on the bottom, so it's 8 take away 2, which is 6. So the first law here was to do with the multiplication, so we add the powers. This has got the brackets, so you times those two powers together. And this line, again, means divide. Normal numbers at the front, we divide as normal. 36 divided by 12 is 3, and then we take the powers away because it's a divide for the two marks there. And again, support, top 40, clip number 36 for laws of indices, index laws. Right, let's move on to question number 12. Okay, question number 12 is worth two marks and support on this type of question can be found on the top 40, clip number 31. Now, a circle has a diameter of 140 centimetres. Diameter means all the way across the middle of the circle, right the way across. Work out the circumference, so that's the outside of the circle. Give your answer correct to three significant figures. Now, I want you to think back to the start when I said about we write down a couple of formulas. Cherry pie is delicious. Circumference equals pi times diameter. Apple pies are two area equals pi times radius squared. So we're dealing with this one here. It's asking us to work out the circumference of a circle. Cherry pies delicious. So I'm going to write that down here. Cherry pies delicious. So the circumference of a circle is pi multiplied by the diameter. Diameter in this case is 140 centimeters. In our calculator we need to make sure we find where pi is and it's shift and that button down the bottom for me here. So I've got the pi symbol on there, times by 140. I'm going to write down all the numbers I see on the calculator display. 439.8229715 centimetres. And the question says, give your answer correct to three significant figures. So one, two, three, we start from the front. So it's those three, but I do have to check the next one number along. That's bigger than five because five or above would shoot this up. So that is going to shoot that up to four, four, zero. So 440 centimeters for the circumference of this circle with diameter 140 centimeters from Cherry Pies Delicious. Again, top 40, clip 31 for support on that type question. Question number 13. Right, question number 13 is a start question again, so we've got to make sure we finish off with a sentence. Axel and Lethner are driving along a motorway. They see a road sign. The road sign shows the distance to Junction 8. It also shows the average time drivers will take to get to Junction 8. The information here, to Junction 8, 30 miles, 26 minutes. The speed limit on the motorway is 70 miles per hour. Lethner says we will have to go faster than the speed limit to go 30 miles in 26 minutes. Is Lethner right? You must show how you got your answer and this question is worth three marks. Now what I'm going to use to help me with this is a formula that you may have seen in your maths or even your science lessons. It's speed equals distance divided by time and we put that sometimes in these pyramids. So speed equals distance divided by 
time. So if I put it in this pyramid like this, and then split up the three sections, so speed is equal to distance divided by time. So when they're on top of each other, it means it's a divide, and when they're next to each other, it's a times. And you cover up the one that you're trying to find. Now I'm trying to prove the speed that's involved to do this bit of information here and then compare it against the speed limit on the motorway. So the speed is distance divided by time, the distance is 30 miles, and the time is 26 minutes. So if I use this formula and do distance divided by time, 30 divided by 26, the problem with that is that it's gonna be miles per minute, not miles per hour. But then I can deal with that after and convert it into hours rather than minutes. So I'm gonna use this formula first, Speed equals distance divided by time, 30 divided by 26. So the speed is going to be equal to distance divided by time. So I'm going to do 30 over 26. I'm going to pop that in the calculator. So 30 divided by 26. And I'm going to write down the whole of that number on my answer paper. So I've got 1.15384654 and don't forget that is miles per minute so I'm going to write that here so that's miles per minute not miles per hour but the easy thing to do now is if this is miles per minute we know there's 60 minutes in an hour so all I've got to do is times this by 60 so 1.15384614 multiplied by 60 and that's going to give me what it is in miles per hour and I've still got the number on the display so just times by 60 69.2307 so just underneath 70 miles per hour so Lethner is actually incorrect they won't have to go faster than the speed limit to do the 30 miles in 26 minutes so I want to put all those numbers down first 076923 and now that is miles per hour and to finish off again we've got the star on this question I've got to finish off with a little sentence so no Lethner is incorrect now there's several ways of being able to deal with this type of question but I've gone for this method here by using the speed equals distance divided by time realizing that distance divided by time is not going to be in miles per hour but miles per minute but then do a quick conversion because there's 60 minutes in an hour to see what it is in miles per hour and again there's several ways of answering this question but this is the way I've gone for on that to get the three marks not forgetting the final sentence there to finish it off because of the star question. Okay, let's move on to question number 14. Right, question number 14 is split up into three parts spread over the next two pages. We've got A, B, and on the next page, part C. So the total for question 14 is worth seven marks and you can find support for all three of these parts on clips number 8 and 12 in the top 40. So it's over two clips for question number 14. Let's go back to the first page. The table gives information about the temperature, T degrees centigrade, at noon in a town for 50 days. And then we've got this frequency table here, this grouped information. Part A, write down the modal class interval for one mark. Modal class, the most common one of these based on the frequency column. So there's six temperatures that are in there. There's eight temperatures that are in there. 13 in there, 21 in this group, and two in there. So the most common group is this one because there are the most frequency in that group there there's 21 temperatures in there my modal class interval so i'm going to put that here 20 t up to 24 for the mode part b calculate an estimate for the mean when it comes to tables mean is when we times across estimate means i'm gonna to have to do a bit of guesswork as well so there's six temperatures that are in there somewhere 
between 8 and 12. Now I don't know where they are, so I'm going to guess, I'm going to say, they're all at the middle of there. So right in the middle of that group. So if you add, and I need to add two extra columns onto this table to be able to do what I want to do. And the first extra column I'm going to call mid. So the midpoint of these groups, so between 8 and 12, right in the middle, is 10. Now if you find it tricky to work out the middle of two numbers, just add them together in the calculator, press equals and then divide by 2. So 8 plus 12 is 20, divide by 2 is 10. So add them together, press equals and divide by 2. Halfway between 12 and 16 is 14, then 18, then 22, then 26. Then we multiply across here, so frequency times the midpoint. So frequency times my midpoint for this column. Put equals there. 6 times 10, 60. Bit trickier for 8 times 14. 112. 13 times 18. 234. 21 lots of 22, 462, and finally 2 lots of 26 is 52. Now what I tend to advise is that we cross off our midpoint here, not so we can't see it underneath, just so we remind ourselves not to use it again to add up anything for the estimate for the mean. So don't strike and colour it all out so you can't see it. Just put a line through it so it reminds us not to use that in terms of adding up. So we need to add up this column here now, our new column. So it's 60 plus 112 plus 234 plus 462 plus 52. That comes to a total of 920. Now that's the total and then I need to divide it by how many we're dealing with. And it's not one, two, three, four, five, don't forget, it's this number here, the 50 days. And if I want to, I could just do a quick check, and it's a good habit to get into, double check that this column, the frequency column, does add up to what it's given in the question. But also, sometimes they won't give this number in the question, so add it up. So it's going to be 920 divided by 50 for my estimate for the mean. 920 divide by 50, I've still got 920 on there, divide by 50 is 18.4. It doesn't say anything about any kind of rounding, so 18.4 degrees centigrade for the estimate of the mean based on the information there in the frequency table. Now that's part B. So moving on to the next side, which is part C, draw a frequency polygon for the information in the table. And we've got this pre-printed graph, it's worth two marks to do this frequency polygon. We've got frequency up the side, we've got temperature on the bottom. We actually use the midpoint again for frequency polygons. So we're going to have to use that midpoint column. It's a good job we didn't actually put so many lines that we couldn't see it. So we're going to use these midpoints here and plot it with the frequency. So we've got frequency up the side, midpoint on the bottom, and we put a cross. So we're going to find 10 on the bottom, 6 up the side, and put a cross. Now we've got to be careful because our scales might not be that great. Across the bottom it's easy. So we're going to be using that number there, 10 for the midpoint. Then it went to 14, uh, then 18, then it was 22 and 26. So they're the numbers on the bottom we're going to be using. But up the side it looks a bit trickier. Any time we're dealing with a graph, we work out the scale. 0 to 5, and there's 10 notches, that means I'm going to be going up in 2s. So spend a bit of time just making sure you know your scale. So that's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And I'm going to carry on putting dashes every 2 squares up the side. I'm not going to number them all. I just want to know my scale for when it plots it, and I don't get any of the points in the wrong place. all the way up to the top. Let's pull this back in. So we're going to do 10 with 6, 14 with 8. So 10 with 6, 10 on the bottom, 6 up the side. So the 6 is going to be 2 notches above the 5 here. Then it was 14 with 8. So 14 with 6, 7 and 8. 18 with 13, so 18 on the bottom goes up to 13, so 10, 11, 12, 13. Again, lining it up with my new dashes I've put on the side. 
22 with 21, so that's going to be one of the notches above the 20, so 21 there, so the two squares above for 21. And then finally, 26 goes with two, so 26, one, two, which is four squares. And to finish this off, we join the crosses up with a ruler and again, a nice sharp pencil in the exam. I'm using a pen here just so it shows out better for the camera. So frequency polygon is using the midpoints and the frequency. Just be careful on your scale for two marks. And yet again, estimate the mean modal class frequency polygon you can find support on clip it's number eight and 12 for this type of question. Let's move on to question number 15. Right, question number 15 is worth three marks, and you can find support on this top 40, clip number 14. Here is a right angle triangle, 39 centimetres, 70 centimetres, work out the length AC, this one here, give your answer correct to one decimal place. So length AC there, so I'm going to put an X on that side to show that's what I'm doing, that's what I'm working out. I always like to show where the hypotenuse is, the longest side of a right angle triangle. That also tells me whether it's an add or a takeaway with Pythagoras. And that's how you work out the third missing side of a right angle triangle if you're given the other two. So because we're working out the longest side, the hypotenuse, the arrow is pointing to what we're finding, it's going to be an add Pythagoras. So it's 39 squared, add 70 squared. Let's get that answer first on the calculator. So 39 squared. Add 70 squared, that comes to 6421. 6421. I've got a bush shelter, square root 6421. So, bush shelter answer. Keep it easy there. And I'm going to write everything down I see on the calculator display 80.13114251. It says correct to one decimal place. So that's going to go from there all the way up to that first number there, but we're going to have to check the next one along. If that's five or above, it shoots this one up. It's not, it's going to leave it as 80.1 centimetres for three marks, Pythagoras, and again, top 40, clip 14 for some purport on that type of question. Right, question number 16. Now question 16 split up into two parts, A and B. A is worth three, B is worth four, so a total of seven marks for this question. Part A, solve, and I've got to work out the value of F that makes this work here for three marks. And I've got some brackets, so I'm going to get rid of the brackets first by expanding. Everything inside the brackets there is going to get multiplied by five. So five F, take away 15, is equal to F plus 10. Now in order to solve it, I want to be able to work out F equals a number. So I want the F this side, and I want the number this side of the equal sign. So this F's in the way here, and that's a positive F, so I'm going to get rid of it by doing a takeaway F. Get rid of it, but I've got to do the same over the other side of the equal sign. Let's tidy that up. 4F, take away 15, that bit hasn't changed yet, equals, now that's gone, equals a plus 10, just a 10. We're getting a bit closer, but this minus 15 is on this side of the equal sign. I want the number over here. So I need to get rid of a minus 15 by again doing the opposite. So I'm going to do a plus 15, gone, and do a plus 15 this side of the equal sign. So I'm down to 4f here, and now 25. This 4f means 4 multiplied by f. So to get rid of that 4, I'll do the opposite again divide by 4. They go, we've got to do the same the other side of the equal sign. So f equals 25 divided by 4, so on the calculator 25 divided by 4 is 6.25 for 3 marks. Solving, working out the value of f in that equation, 6.25. Now part b is also a solve, but this time we're dealing with fractions. Now in order to add a fraction, I need to have the same denominators throughout. Now I can get them all to be six by multiplying this by two, this by three, and that's already a six. Whatever you do to the bottom, we must do to the top. So whatever we do to this denominator, 
we must do to the top. So I'm going to times the whole of this fraction by 2 to get it to be 6 on the bottom. I'm going to times the whole of this fraction by 3, and this one is already over 6. So the bottom of this one, the denominator, is now 6. Two lots of the top as well, though. So we're going to do it to the top. I'm going to put brackets in, h plus 7. Then plus. Now this one's over 6 as well now, but it's three lots of the top row as well. And then equals 5 sixths. In order to be able to solve this to work out the value of h, I've got to do a bit more tidying up first. I've got to expand these brackets like what we did up in part A. So I've got to do two lots of everything in there and three lots of everything in there. So 2h plus 14 over 6 plus 6h minus 3 for this part over 6 equals 5 sixths. Now, because we've got the same denominator here, that means I can just add the top rows. So this now is going to be all over 6 equals 5 sixths, and I can just add the top row. So I've got 2h plus 6h, so I've got 8h. I've got 14, but a minus 3. So plus 14 and a minus 3 leaves me with plus 11. So I've got 8h plus 11 over 6 equals 5 sixths. Now we're getting a bit closer to being able to solve this now. Now because I've got fractions on both sides, I can cross multiply. Cross multiply means I can do this top times that bottom and that top there times that bottom over there. So six lots of all of this. So I'm going to introduce some more brackets. So six lots of 8h plus 11 is equal to 6 lots of 5, which is 30. Again, more brackets, so I've got to expand this again. So that 6 is going to multiply these two things now. 6 lots of 8h is 48h, plus 6 lots of 11 is 66. And now we're at a final stage of being able to, like we were up in the first part of this question, part A, we can solve this a little bit easier. So plus 66 is in the way. I want the numbers over here. So I'm going to do a takeaway 66. Do the same over here. So I've got 48h equals 30 takeaway 66. And we can use the calculator if we want to. That comes to minus 36. Final thing to get rid of is, is this 48 that's multiplying the h, so I need to divide by 48, but I need to do the same over there. So finally, h is equal to this, and I'm going to put this in the calculator, minus 36, divide by 48, and that comes to minus 0 0.75 for four marks. We had to make sure the denominators were the same before dealing with any of the normal solving parts. We had to get these over six. Whatever we do to the bottom, we do to the top. Bit of expanding, then we can add the fractions, bit of cross multiplying, expanding again, and then straightforward solving to get it down to minus 0 0.75. Four marks for part B. Right, moving on to question 17. Okay, question 17 split up into two parts again, part A and part B, but this time they're actually directly linked to each other. Part A, two marks, part B, two marks, four in total, and you can get support on the top 40 clip number 19 for this question or this type of question. So part A is to complete the table based on this equation here, y equals x cubed minus 4x. Here's my values of x, and I'm going to put those values of x into that formula there. So it's going to be 1 cubed take away 4 times 1, 2 cubed take away 4 times 2, and the same with the minus numbers. Let's just write that down for one of them here. I like starting with the positive numbers first, it's a bit easier. So it's 1 cubed take away 4 times 1. Now we can type that into the calculator, but I think it's quite a straightforward sum. 1 cubed is 1, take away 4, because 4 times 1 is 4. So 1 take away 4 is minus 3. Let's just show you that on the calculator. 1 cubed take away 4 times 1, literally typed in as I said it, is minus 3. This one here is going to be 2 cubed take away 4 times 2. 2 cubed is 8, 4 times 2 is 8, so it's 8 take away 8, it's a 0. And again, I'm just going to double check that on the calculator. 2 cubed take away 4 times 2, 0. 
Now the minus numbers, more so with squares than cubes, but I always advise wrapping the minus number in brackets when you're dealing with powers. And uh, let me just show you what I mean by that one with this number here. So minus two in brackets, then cube it, take away four times minus two. Now don't need to worry about brackets here, it's just round the powered ones. More so with squares, but it's a good habit to get into to make sure we don't get the wrong answer come out. Minus two wrapped in brackets, cubed, take away four times minus two. And that comes to zero again. The minus three, so open a bracket, minus three, close the bracket, cube, take away four times minus three this time, gives me minus 15. So there's my two marks for the first part taking care with the minus numbers there. Now part B, on the grid draw the graph of y equals x cubed minus 4x, which is this here, from minus 3 for x up to 3 for x. So basically the numbers are given in this table here. So it's saying plot these, and these are coordinates along the corridor, up and down the stairs. So minus three, minus 15. And we're just gonna make sure we take care with our scale. Along the corridor, the x-axis is quite straightforward. Up the stairs, one, three. They're gonna be halfway in the middle. So just be careful when we plot our odd numbers on the y scale. Minus three, minus 15. Minus three, minus 15 is actually gonna be right in the middle down here. Minus two with zero, so along the corridor and on zero. Minus one with three, minus one with three. Again, an odd number, so taking care there. So it's right in the middle between the two and the four. Zero, zero. One minus three. Minus two, minus three, minus four, so there. Two with zero, so along the corridor against two with zero. And three with 15 three all the way up to the top here nearly with 15 and there's our crosses now because it's a cubed we know this is going to be a curve so we don't join these up with a ruler it's a nice freehand flowing joining them up making sure not to miss any of these crosses out and kind of exaggerate these curves a little bit don't join them up so straight just bring the flow down that's it and then going up through this one, and finally up to the very final cross there. And again, we should be really using a pencil, a nice sharp pencil in the exam for that type of question. So part A was to actually get the coordinates, part B plotting them, four marks in total. And again, support top 40, clip number 19 for that type of question. Right, question number 18. Okay, ABC is an isosceles triangle. A, B, C, two angles the same there, 54 degrees, and 12 centimeters going along the bottom. Work out the area of the triangle, give your answer correct to three significant figures. The question's worth four marks, and you can get support on this type of question with the top 40, clip number 15. So our diagram here has 12 centimeters going along the bottom, along the base, We've got our two angles the same, for it being an isosceles triangle, and we've got to work out the area. Now to work out the area of a triangle, it's base multiplied by the perpendicular height, the straight height going right up, not an angled height, the straight height, perpendicular height, and then you half it, you divide it by two. So base times height, then divide by two. So I've got to do 12 multiplied by how high this is, and then half it, but I don't know how high this triangle is. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna put a dotted line coming down there to show that's the side I'm trying to find first. In fact, I'm gonna call that X, because I need to find the height of this triangle before I can work out the area. So 12 multiplied by whatever X is, and then divide by two. Now what I've just created there by bringing down that line, I'll just cover up half, but I've got a right angle triangle, because that is a perfect straight line coming down. In fact, it's two right angle triangles. So I've got two right angle triangles next to each other now. 
Now in terms of working out the height here, I can use Sokotoa. I can use trigonometry by just considering half of the triangle. So what I'm going to do here, I'm just going to redraw half of the triangle. It doesn't matter which half you, re you redraw. 54 degrees. Now this is going to be 6 centimetres across the bottom because it's 12 across the whole line. 6 centimetres. I'm working out X. I've got the 54 degrees. So I'm just going to deal with this by using trigonometry, our soccer tower. I've got an angle, I've got a side, and I'm trying to find a second side. The first thing I'll do is put my arrow pointing away from my right angle. That's my hypotenuse. Opposite my angle is O. Next to my angle, adjacent. Then I'm going to write down Sokotoa. Some old horses can always hear their owner's approach. And don't forget, I've already put that at the front in that formula booklet, the formula page at the start of the exam paper to help me to remember it when I need to recall it throughout the exam paper. So I can flick back to that page at this point to recall how to write down Sokotoa. Some old horses can always hear their owner's approach. I'm going to cross off the one that I'm not dealing with. So I've got an X here. I've got a number here, 6. I've got nothing over there and I don't need to find it. O and A, the last part, TOA. T stands for TAN. Put the angle with the word syncosal TAN once we've decided which one we're using. So it's going to be TAN 54 equals O on top of A. So X on top of 6. When the letter's on the top, we times these two together. When the letter's down, we divide the two together. So T for top for times, D for down for divide. So wherever the letter is, it tells me what to do. So the letter's on the top, I'm going to times these two together. So it's six lots of this. So X is going to equal six times tan 54. Bring my calculator in. So six times tan 54, 8.25829.1523. I'm going to write all of that number down. So 8.25829.1523. That's the height, don't forget. X, the height of this triangle. So the area is going to be 12 multiplied by this number and then divide by 2 because it's a triangle. So 12 times that number we've just worked out, divide by 2. Base times height, then half it. So I'm going to put here area equals 8.25829.1523 multiplied by the base, which was 12, so base times height, and then I'm going to divide it by 2. So I can just use what's on my calculator already. Multiplied by the 12, not the 6, because don't forget we're going back to the original triangle now we've worked out x. Press equals, and then divide by 2, because it's a triangle. And again, I'm going to write down the whole of that number before I round it for my final answer. The answer wants it to be correct to three significant figures. Three significant figures starts from the front. So one, two, three. So I want to undone it up to there. I'll check the next one number along. If that's a five or above, it shoots this up. But because it's not, it's underneath five. My answer is 49.5 centimetres squared for the area of this triangle. And what I had to do, I had to add this line to my picture and that's what made it stand out. It's two right angle triangles. I know how to deal with right angle triangles by using Sokotoa, my trigonometry. Trigonometry on one of those right angle triangles to get the height, and then it's 12 times the height divided by two to get the area of this triangle. And again, this Sokotoa, I put down at the start of the exam paper on my formula page, so I can recall it at any point throughout the exam. Four marks, and again, top 40, clip 15 for support on that type of question. Right, let's have a look at question number 19. 
Question number 19 then, part A, write 7.8 times 10 to the power of minus 4 as an ordinary number for one mark. Minus 4 means it's going to be a zero point number zero point and then some zeros and then a seven and an eight now what you can do is work backwards so you can put a seven and eight first imagine the decimal point is there from what it is on the standard form and it's going to go from here one two three four to here and under my arcs i'm going to put zeros so four hops from where it was one, two, three, four to where it is now, zero point number. Then we've got 95,600,000 in standard form. So I need to put the number between one and 10 that I've got, which is going to be 9.56, multiplied by 10. Now, decimal point is at the end of any large number like this, and it's gone one, two, three, four, five, six, seven to the power of seven not a minus seven because it's not a zero point number it's a large number so 9.56 times 10 to the power of seven for those two marks in question number 19. moving down to question number 20 which is on the same side and this one's worth three marks for question number 20. in a sale normal prices are reduced by 20 percent a washing machine has a sale price of £464. By how much money is the normal price of the washing machine reduced? Now this is reverse percentages. In terms of reverse percentages, I mean we're trying to work out something in the past before this item was on sale. Because we've got the, the new amount, we need to know what it was before the sale. So, I don't know what it was. The sale then knocked 20% off, so the multiplier is 0 0.8, and that comes to £464. In order to work out the original, we work backwards, so you do the opposite, 464 divide by 0 0.8, and that's going to tell us what it was before the sale. So 464 divided by 0 0.8 is £580. So before the sale it was 580 don't forget, we're actually working out what the discount has been. So 580, take away the 464. 580, take away 464, is 116 pounds. Reverse percentages, we don't know what it was at the start. We know that it was reduced by 20%, so they multiplied by 0.8. That's the sale price, reverse it by doing a divide, and then just do the difference, which is going to be £116 for the three marks for question 20. Moving on to question number 21. Okay, question number 21 is broken into two parts, A and B. One mark for part A, three for B, four in total. Now, part A, factorise, and this is a difference of two squares question. To factorise something like this with these two square numbers, it factorises down to double brackets. 2x plus a 3, and then 2x minus a 3. The square root of 4, 2, the square root of the 9, a 3, one with a plus, one with a minus, to be able to get it back down to the minus 9. Difference of two squares for one mark. Part B, make M the subject. That means I want M equals everything else. I want the M on its own. But the problem is I've got M's here and M's there, so I need to get them together first. So I'm going to get rid of it from this side and put it over there, because I don't like dealing with the minuses either. So minus 3M, so let's get rid of it by doing a plus 3M. That means it's gone from that side. But that means I've got to do the same over here, so I've got to add a 3M. Let's tidy that up. G equals AM plus 5 plus 3M. I've got the M's here, but this plus 5 needs to go from this side. I need to get it over there. So I need to do a minus 5. And let's do the same over there. Let's tidy it up. Now all my M's are together on one side. But again, I've got them in two parts. And I can't add these together because that's an A with an M and that's a 3 with an M. So what I need to do... So this part's not going to change. I need to factorise this side. I need to take the M out. M, open bracket... A plus 3. MA, this part. M3, or 3M, this part. So I'll factorise the right-hand side. Now, in order to get the M on its own, I need to divide by 
what it's being multiplied by at the moment. So get rid of this, because it's times in, by dividing. There you go. Let's do the same over that side. And there's my answer. M equals this part. So on my dotted line, I'm just going to put it a bit neater. M equals G minus 5, all divided by A plus 3 for those three marks for part B of question 21. Making M the subject, M is now on its own there. Moving on to question number 22. Part A and part B again for this question. Two for part A and three marks for part B, so five marks in total. Then we've got this diagram of the trapezium. All the measurements are in centimetres. The area of the trapezium is 351 centimetres squared. Part A, show this. 2x squared plus x minus 351 equals zero. And they've given me this real key bit of information. The area of this trapezium is 351, which is visible here in what they're asking me to show. And this is worth two marks. Now this is where it's key again to keep flicking back to the formula page, because here on the top right hand side is how to work out the area of a trapezium. A and B are the two parallel lines in a trapezium. So if we add those two together, then multiply by the height, and then half our answer, that's how you get the area of a trapezium. So I'm going to write that down in this question here. So I'm just going to put it over here. So area equals a half, open bracket, A plus B, all times by the H. So in this question, H is 2X, A is X minus 4, and B is X plus 5. Now I'm going to deal with the half part at the end. So hopefully it'll be quite straightforward and we just half everything that we see. So the area is going to be A plus B first, which is going to be this plus this. So I'm going to write this down first here. So X minus 4 plus X plus 5. Then if we multiply all that by the height, which is 2X, and then half it, it should come to 351. So let's expand this. Really, I should write that on the front to make it look a bit easier, but 2x multiplied by all this, but I'm gonna tidy this up inside the brackets first. I've got x and x there, which is 2x, a plus five and a minus four, so that becomes plus one. Now I am gonna put that at the front to make my life easier. So I've got 2x and I've gotta multiply everything inside the bracket. So I'm going to have 4x squared plus 2x. And all of this, don't forget, equals the area, which is going to be 351. But first, I've still got my half, so I've got to half these. So now I'm going to multiply all this by that half. So I'm going to half everything. That's the easiest way to do this. So 4x squared is 2x squared plus 2x is now plus 1x. We've said this equals 351. And what they've asked me to do is show that 2x squared plus x minus 351 is equal to zero. So in order to get this to zero, I'm just gonna take away 351 from this side, gone, but I've gotta write minus 351 over on this side as well. So let's tidy that up for a final line of working. Equals zero. And all I've done is use the formula on the front page in the formula sheet to be able to work out the area of the trapezium, which is already given. So all I have to do is say it's equal to 351, take it away to get to zero, take it away, and we're done for the two marks. Part B, work out the value of x. Now this is a quadratic equation, and I'm going to use the quadratic formula to solve this, and that is actually given, again, on the front formula page, the quadratic equation. x equals minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So I want to put that formula here. x equals minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So a is the coefficient here, this one. So a is 2. B is the coefficient in front of the second part, the B, so it's 1. And C is minus 351. A, B, 
C. And I've got to put these three into here. So it's going to be minus that, so minus 1, plus or minus the square root of B squared, so 1 squared, minus 4 times that, times that. So first of all, I've, I've just brought down the minus as it is there. 4 times 2 times minus 351. And that comes to minus 2808. Minus 2808. Now, two minuses there make a plus. All divided by 2a, two times that, two is four. Now, this is going to get tidied up quite quickly. So that's minus one, plus or minus the square root of, and I need to do one squared minus, and a minus made a plus. So, one squared, so underneath that square root symbol, one squared plus. 2808, which is really just 1 plus 2808, so it's going to be 2809. Square root of 2809 over 4. Now, I'm at the point now of seeing that this is going to be quite a large number still when I square root that. Minus 1 plus this large number is going to be a positive number on the top, then divide by 4. Minus 1 take away this big number and then divide by 4 is going to give me a negative answer. So I'm going to have one positive answer and one negative answer. And that's important when it comes to actually answer this in a second. So minus 1 plus the square root of 2809. Press equals there. And then I'm going to divide by 4. So 13 or minus 1 take away the square root of 2809. Press equals and then divide by 4 minus 13.5. Now bear in mind the question is actually working out the value of x which is a length of a side. So I've got to have a positive number to have a positive length of a side. I can't have a negative length of a side. So my answer is the positive value 13 for the three marks for part B. So both of these two questions, part A and part B for question 22, were found and really useful information was on the formula sheet at the front of the exam paper. Area of a trapezium for part A, and just plug in all the information into there, then part B, the quadratic equation, the quadratic formula to get 13 for the value of x for the final three marks. Well, let's move on to question 20. Three. Question number 23 is worth two marks and the table shows information about 1065 students, we've got male, female and the different year groups. Eleanor takes a stratified sample of 120 students by year group and by gender. Work out the number of year eight female students in a sample. And as you can see, I've circled that there, the year eight female students, 134. Now what I need to do is work out the percentage that 134 is of 1065. This number of this number, what percentage that is, and then apply it to my 120. So I want the same percentage that this is out of the total for the 120 for this female year eight to be part of my sample. So it's got to be a fair stratified sample. So first of all, let's see what percentage it is. So 134 out of 1065, and then to make it a percentage, we times by 100, like we did earlier on in the exam paper. So 134 divide by 1065, press equals at that point, and then times by 100 to make it the percentage. Now I know it's a nasty percentage, but we're going to write the lot down. 12.58215962%. And what we need now is 12.58, this number here, percentage of the 120 sample that she's choosing. And that'll be a fair reflection then of the year eight females out of a sample, as it's the same percentage as it is out of the total. So I need to do 1% first, so divide by 100, then times by 12.58. So I'm going to do 120 divided by 100 to get 1%, and then to get this 12%, or this 12.582159629622%, I apply that as a multiplier there. So 120 divided by 100, which is 1%, 
but I want this 12.58215962 so I multiply by that and that comes to again a long number but we're going to write everything down and that's how many people I need to choose out of the 120 sample to be a fair reflection of the year eight females that was out of the original amount. Now I can't choose 15 point of a person. We need to look at this number and we can't round when we're talking about people. So I need to get 15 year eight female students. So my answer is 15 purely because we can't round because we're dealing with people. We can't have part of a person. Percentage that this represents and apply the percentage to the sample that we're taking, 15 people, for two marks. Moving on to question number 24. Question number 24 then is worth three marks. The diagram shows a large tin of pet food in the shape of a cylinder. The large tin has a radius of 6.5 centimetres and a height of 11.5 centimetres. A pet food company wants to make a new size tin and the new tin will have a radius of 5.8 centimetres, so different to this one, but it will have the same volume. The space inside it will be exactly the same. Calculate the height of the new tin, give your answer correct to one decimal place for those three marks. Now again, recapping the start of the exam paper, volume of the prism, 3D shape, where it's the same all the way along, is the area of the cross section multiplied by the length. So the volume of this cylinder is going to be the area of the circle at the top there multiplied by 11.5. So the area of the shape times by the length. Now the shape there is a circle, so again, something we put down at the start of the exam was our cherry pie delicious apple pies R2. Area of a circle is pi times radius squared. So we're going to first work out the area of this circle, which is going to be apple pies R2, which is going to be pi times 6.5 squared. So that's the area of this circle. So it's going to be pi times 6.5 squared. And I've got a long number there, but I'm going to put the lot down again. So 132.7322. 896 to make the volume it's the area of the cross section multiplied by the length so I've got to do the area of the cross section multiplied by the length so just keep that on the display times by 11.5 so the volume the volume of this large tin is 1526.421331 centimeters cubed so I'm going to write that now. So the volume equals 1526.421331 centimetres cubed. And they're telling me now that the volume of the new tin is the same. So it's going to be the same there. But they want me to work out the height of the new tin. So let's think about what we've just done on the original one and apply it to the new one. The volume of the new one is going to be the area of the circle times by the height or the length this one here which comes to 1526 but we don't know the height so it's going to be on the new tin so I want to write new tin here it's going to be pi times 5.8 squared times by the height the new height that we don't know but we do know that's going to come out as 1526.421331. Now in order to work out the height, I need to get rid of these two. Now they're all times in, so to get rid of them, I need to divide. To get rid of them like we've done several times already throughout this exam paper. But whatever we do one side of the equal sign, we've got to do over here as well. And that's how we're going to work out the height of the new tin. This number divide by this. Now I've still got that on my calculator display. So I'm going to press divide. I'm going to open a bracket. So I'm going to type all that in one go now. Pi times 5.8 squared. 
so it's dividing by all of it. Close my bracket, and there's the height of the new tin. I'm going to again write all this down. So 14.443370099 centimeters. The question says, give your answer correct to one decimal place, which is up to there. The four is not big enough to change it. So my answer is 14.4 centimeters for the height of the new tin. Again, by looking back and getting information from the very front formula sheet at the start of the exam. Right, question number 25. Okay, question number 25 is a starred, so we're going to get a mark for our quality of written communication again, and it's worth three marks for this question. A and B are straight lines. Line A has this equation, but line B, we don't have the equation, we've just got two points that it goes through. Do lines A and B intersect, so will they cross over? You must show all your work in. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is change that equation there for line A into the format that I prefer, which is called Y equals MX plus C. So there's no number in front of the Y, which there is at the moment. We've got a number in front of the X and then a number on its own. And then the M and the C are really important. The M is the gradient and the C is where it intercepts, it crosses over on the Y axis, this axis here. So to do that, I'm gonna to need to divide everything by two to get rid of the two there, to make it Y on its own. So divide everything by two, so that's gonna come out as Y equals, divide this part by two, 1.5X, divide this side by two as well, plus four. So all I've done I've just divided everything by two to have it in the format of y equals mx plus c, which gives me two bits of information, key bits of information. Then I've got this here, line b goes through two points. Now what I'm gonna try and do is see if I can create or get some information like what I've got here. Now, I like when we've had questions and we've seen it on this clip as well, in terms of drawing a graph. Now I like having an x, y box with all my information in. So I'm going to put this in, x, y. Now my x numbers go from minus 1 up to 2. So I'm going to just do minus 1, 0, 1, 2. And it goes with a minus 1 on the x for a 2 on the y. So that's 2. The 2 goes with an 8. Now because it's a line, a straight line, this must go in a pattern. So it's going to go 2, 4, 6, 8. Now that's really key here. When x equals zero here, y equals four on the y-axis. So this line is gonna chop through the number four on the y-axis, but we've already spotted that this line also, by changing it to y equals mx plus c, is also gonna chop through four on the y-axis. So both of these lines are gonna chop through at the same point. So yes, they are going to intercept at x equals zero, y equals four. So my working out here really is to show this in terms of y equals mx plus c, and this in terms of some obvious nice information, and you can see there a coordinate, which is the same as that coordinate. So yes, the lines will intersect, cross over at zero, four along the corridor zero four there and there for three marks for question 25. right let's move on to question number 26. okay question number 26 is worth a massive five marks and we've got a diagram here with a non-right angle triangle al m n calculate the length of al n Give your answer correct to three significant figures. Now the chances are a non-right angle triangle is going to have something to do with the sine and cosine rule, which again are in the formula sheet at the front of the exam paper, not forgetting that you can flip all of them and have another looking version of the sine rule. So the sine and cosine rule, and we're trying to work out the length al n, this length here. Now I'm going to put an x here, so in order to have this, to find this, I need its opposite angle. I need a matching pair, but I don't. But I do have two sides, and I do have one matching pair. 
So what I need to do in order to work out this angle to be a matching pair with my X, I need to first work out this angle and use these matching pairs. And then I can use 180 to take away these two angles. So I need to work out this angle first. I'm going to call that Y to keep it a different letter than the X that we're trying to find. So we're going to find the Y first and we're going to apply the sine rule with the angle on the top. So sin Y over its side for its matching pair, 12.8, is equal to this matching pair that we've actually got there in the question. So sin 136 over 15.7. In order to get this, which is what we're after, I can just multiply the 12.8 across. So sin y is equal to 12.8 multiplied by all of this side, which is going to be the sin 136 over 15.7. Now I'm going to work out this bit first in the calculator and then multiply by 12.8. So sin 136. Now be careful because if your calculator does this and open out to bracket, you can't just go straight ahead and type in divide by 15.7. You've either got to close the bracket or what I like to do, I'll just press equals at this point and just get a total for that top row. So sin 136 is this number on the display. Divide by 15.7, so leave it on the display and just press divide by 15.7 and equals. And I like to press equals at each step. So this bit in the bracket here is 0 0.0442, etc. this number on the display. But don't forget, I'm timesing it by 12.8, so leave it on the display, times by 12.8. Sin y equals this number here. Let's type that, let's write that down. So sin y equals 0.56634567788. But don't forget, I'm actually trying to find y, not sin of y. So I need to type in sin to the minus one of this number. So again, I'm going to leave it on the display and just tap shift sin ans answer equals. 34.49 so y the actual angle is equal to 34.4957898 degrees so this angle here now i don't normally like to round early in an exam but i am going to because don't forget it's not this angle i really want it's this one down here to be a matching pair with the x so i'm going to call this one 34.5 degrees so this is 34.5 five degrees and I've written on the picture there so in order to work out this angle for the side I want to work with the side it's going to be 180 take away these two so 180 take away the 136 take away the 34.5 so 180 take away 136 take away 34.5 gives me 9.5 degrees let's add that to the picture now that's the angle I need to be a matching pair with the side I'm trying to find. Now at this point, you've got two choices where to go. You could use the cosine rule with a matching pair, or you could use the sine rule again with a matching pair. It's completely up to you which one you go through. So you bring it in that formula sheet again. Because we've got the matching pair, for example, the A with the A for the angle, or we could have the matching pair in terms of the sine rule. Now I'm going to use sine rule again. I'm going to do side over angle this time instead of angle over side like I did previously. So my matching pair for what I'm trying to find out is going to be x over sin 9.5 is equal to, and I'll use the matching pair here that was printed with both of them pre-given not this one, I'm going to go for this one here, which is 15.7 for the side over sin 136. And again, we can completely cross multiply this over to there. So my x is going to be 15.7 over sin 136. And then I'm going to multiply it by the sin 9.5. So calculator in 15.7, divide by sin 136. Now because I'm finishing at that point, I can just press equals. 
and then multiplied by sin 9.5 times by, leave it on the display, sin 9.5 and there's my answer, 3.73, let's write all this down 3.73024715 three significant figures is the first three numbers, one, two, three check the next one along, it's not big enough to change it so my answer is 3.73 three centimetres. And the way I've dealt with this tricky question, this five mark question, is by doing two sign rules, getting matching pairs. So one matching pair, use the sign rule to get another matching pair, then angles in a triangle add up to 180, and then you've got the choice whether to do sin rule, the sign rule, or the cos rule, the cosine rule, going into the final step. Now you've got the matching pair where the answer is the one we're trying to find here. This X is the one we're trying to find. Two sign rules is what I went for. 3.73 centimetres is your final answer. Right, let's have a look at question number 27. Now question 27 is worth three marks and you can get a bit of support on this type of question on the top 40 clip number 13. So the histogram shows information about the times in minutes that some passengers had to wait at an airport. Then we've got our frequency density up the side, our time on the bottom and the classic histogram type look where you've got these different width bars across the bottom. Now don't forget frequency density is not the frequency, the frequency is going to be actually the area of these bars. Work out the percentage of the passengers who had to wait for more than one hour. So if we look along the bottom here, time, we're actually going to be dealing with and looking at from here onwards up to there, so longer than one hour. Work out the percentage of the passengers, so we need to be looking at the frequency, the number of people who had to wait for more than one hour. So I need to know the areas of these bars, because that will give me the frequency. That will be the number of people, so the area of that first bar will be the number of people that had to wait between 0 and 20 minutes. So the area is going to be the base times the height. So I need 20, because that's how fat the group is, the width of the group, multiplied by 12. Now I'm just going to turn my bars around this way for a second. I'm going to write my multiplications in the bars. So the width times the frequency density times the height is going to give me the area, which is the frequency. So 20 multiplied by 12. I'm going to work that out in each bar as well. So 20 times 12 is 240. So it's 240 passengers that had to wait between 0 and 20 minutes. The width of this group, 20 up to 30, so that's going to be 10 multiplied by the height of that, that bar. So we've got to be careful on this one. It actually doesn't go to a nice number, so I've got to know my scale here. So 10 to 11, there's five notches, so it's going to be 0.2s, so that's going to be 10.8 up to this bar here, so 10.8. So 10 times 10.8 is going to be 108. This one is going to be 30 up to 45, so that's going to be 15, and that meets nicely at 7. So that's 15 times 7, and 15 times 7 is 105. This one is 15 again, because it's 45 up to 60, and it reaches up to 5. So that one's 15 multiplied by 5 this time. So 15 multiplied by 5 is 50, 67, 75. This bar, this wide bar here, is going from 60 up to 90. So that's going to be 30, and it reaches up to one notch under two, so that's 1.8. So this one's going to be 30 times 1.8, and that comes to 54. And this final one goes from 90 to 120, so that's 30, and it reaches up to 0 0.246, 0 0.6. So I'm just going to write it this way to keep it like all the others. 30 times 0 0.6. 30 times 0.6 is 18. 
So what I've got here, put it back this way, I've just worked out the areas of all of the bars. The width, the group width, multiplied by the frequency density gives me areas, which actually gives me the frequency. So that's how many passengers. So what I'm going to do now is just quickly work out what the total number of passengers was. So that's going to be 240 plus 108 plus 105 plus 75 plus 54 plus 18. So 105 plus 75 plus 54 plus 18 gives me exactly 600. So I've got 600 passengers in total. Now my question is, work out the percentage of the passengers who had to wait for more than one hour. So these are the ones that had to wait for more than one hour. 54 plus 18, this section here. So 54 plus 18 is 72. So I'm gonna write that first. So 54 plus 18 is 72. So 72 people had to wait longer than an hour. And my question is percentage. So 72 out of 600. So I'm gonna write that 72 out of 600. And we've seen this a couple of times now over this exam paper. To make that a percentage, we times it by 100. So 72 divide by 600, press equals at that point, and then times by 100, makes it 12%. Put that in the dotted line as well, 12%. So what I've done, I've had to work out the actual number of people, the frequency, by using my knowledge that this is frequency density up the side, it's a histogram, so the frequency is actually the area. I've done the group width multiplied by the, the frequency density, the height to get the number of passengers for each section, the total. We're only dealing with here, these two, this area here, 54 plus 18 was 72 out of 600, make it percentage times by 100. So it's 12% who had to wait longer than one hour for question number 27. And again, there's a bit of support in terms of understanding histograms on the top 40 clip number 13. Right, let's move on to the final question, question number 28. Right, we've got a star on this question, so it means to get the full three marks, we are gonna have to put down a sentence to finish it off. AOC, AOC, this line here, and BOD, this line here, are diameters of a circle. So they're telling me that those two lines are the same, with center zero. Prove that triangle ABD a, B, D, this one, and triangle D, C, A, D, C, A, this one, the one that's overlapping, are congruent. So we've got to prove that these two are the same triangle. Now, there's three ways of proving congruency. We've got A, S, A, which is angle, side, angle. So we've got to prove that two angles and a side are the same with these triangles. There's R, H, S, which is show right angles, prove the hypotenuse are the same, and then an extra side are the same. And then there's SAS, two sides and an angle. So prove two sides and an angle are the same in the two triangles. So you've got your options of which route to go through. And I'm going to choose RHS, right angle, hypotenuse, side. And the reason I'm choosing that is because I know of a circle theorem. When you've got the diameter of a circle and you go off and meet at the circumference, I know that it makes a right angle. That's a circle theory I know about. So I know for a fact, because that's a diameter, I know that this is going to be a right angle, and also, the same there, I know that's going to be a right angle as well. So I need to, if I'm going to go for RHS, which is right angle hypotenuse side, I need to first prove R, which is right angle. So the first thing I'm going to do is, number one, right angle. So I'm going to say then that angle B, A, D, BAD, so you could write BAD, or you could put a little hat above the A, is equal to CDA. CDA. I'm going to put a hat above there. So you could write angle BAD equals angle CDA, but we'll put the little hat above the middle letter there to show that it means the angle that we're talking about. But I've got to say why. Angles at the circumference of a semicircle or something along the lines of these words, so the angle at the circumference in this semicircle are 90 degrees. So there's my right angle proof. 
I've said that those angles are the same. I've put it on the picture as well, and I've said, I've stated my circle theory. Angles at the circumference in the semicircle, and you can see it there, at 90 degrees. So that's my right angle. Now I'm going to say something about the hypotenuse, and that's actually quite a straightforward one. The hypotenuse, the longest side of these two triangles, if you point your arrow out, are these two lines, AOC and BOC, which are, in the words here, the diameters of the circle. So I know they're the same. The hypotenuse of these two triangles are equal. It says there that the diameters. So I'm going to say here that B to D, B to D equals C to A. And I'm going to put here underneath it, they are the diameters of the circle. So I've done my right angle, I've now done my hypotenuse, and the third point of my RHS that I chose is side. So I've got to choose another side of these triangles. So there's that one that I could compare to that one, but I don't think I've got any information on there. But look at the bottom. The bottom of this side triangle is also the bottom of that one. So they've got to be the same because they are a shared side. So I can put that down as my final point. So A to D, AD is the shared side. A to D is the shared side of the two triangles. And I've proved right angle, hypotenuse, and side. So I'm going to put in words just to finish it off. So A, B, D and D, C, A are congruent because of R, H, S. Right angle, hypotenuse, side. And again, we could do different routes to get there, A, S, A or S, A, S, but we've gone for, on this question, I've gone for right angle, hypotenuse and side. And there's my three points for the three marks in total there for question number 28. I hope you've done well on this Edexcel Calculator November 2013 exam paper. Well done and good luck.